Now, it is not only electronics and foodstuffs that have been looted in recent days. The looting of medical supplies and attacks on depots has been alarming. Afrox, which is a major supplier of medical gas, says it will continue to prioritise the delivery of oxygen to state hospitals dealing with COVID-19 patients, but it cannot guarantee supply. Let's look at the impact now specifically for pharmacies. We're joined by the CEO of the regulator, the South Africa Pharmacy Council, that Vincent Tlala. Mr. Tlala, thank you for being with us. Can you give us a, a countrywide or I guess across these two provinces how many pharmacies have been attacked? Thank you, Francis, and thank you to the viewers. Uh, the, currently, the numbers of pharmacies that have been affected by this carnage is 131. 76 of those are in the independent pharmacies and the remainder it's corporate or what we refer to as chain pharmacies. Okay, so many are, are independent, meaning unlike the, the big chains like Clicks and Diskim, uh, it'll be harder for, for them to rebuild. We, we agree with yourself. The, many of these independent pharmacies would have taken their hard-earned money to be able to establish their business. Roughly, it will require a sum of about a million to put up a pharmacy. So some of them might not be able to recover. It might take two to three years to recover from this. Yeah, how sad. And what is the impact for, for the people around them to get um, medical supplies? Do we have enough pharmacies that, that if one is closed, there's always another nearby? Or could there be a material impact? At this stage, Francis, we're not worried about the number of pharmacies, both in Kauteng and uh, KZN. I think what is worrisome is that for the last 10 years, we've been trying to bring services to the under-service area or the so-called previously disadvantaged areas where we've had pharmacies closer to the people. Now they would have to take taxis to get their medicines. And I think that's where it is, it is disheartening. We also want to bring it to the attention of the community not to buy any medicines that are stolen or from the black market, including vaccines, because we cannot guarantee any safety or efficacy or quality of such medicines once they leave ph pharmacy where they were kept in good storage conditions. We're not sure what's happening out there. So we ask the members of our community not to buy any stolen medicines, including yeah. vaccines. And it's incredible that so much uh, medicine, so, so, so such a large quantity of medical goods uh, was stolen. Are, are you hearing of a thriving black market already? Not at this stage. We, we worry that in the next few or so weeks, these medicines might make themselves available on the streets. So I think the caution we want to make to our communities not to buy such medicines a report such to the police for those who might have stolen them and they want to return them please do return them to the nearest pharmacy where they could be disposed of properly because medicines cannot just be disposed of in the drains or toilets or anywhere yeah. they need to be detected properly a right, good point. Now, now you talk about these uh, pharmacies that have tried to get closer to the people they serve. So, so uh, people with chronic conditions don't have to get into a taxi and, and drive uh, for a long while to, to get to their provider. What is the picture? I mean, uh, in the communities, are there these smaller providers or are there a lot of DISCIM and, and clicks um, because they are the dominant ones? But I, I guess the good thing there is that they can start moving supplies around now and, and restock pretty quickly. It is a mixture of both, uh, Francis. I think for the big chain pharmacies, because most of them might have the chronic prescription stored digitally remotely or what we refer to as cloud solutions, uh, those patients who've been seen, those pharmacies might have access to those records. For the small pharmacies, I think that's where the difficult might come in. But we take it that most of the small pharmacies know their patients. Uh, they would direct those patients to their doctors so that they can make uh, new copies of prescription. And can the pharmacies, if they are able to restart, 
would be able to serve those patients yeah. or refer them to the closer community, ne community pharmacies next to them. Uh, finally, there's a lot of uh, talk about the ability of SASRIA, which is the insurer of, of insurers, uh, around looting and, and mob violence and things like that, uh, to pay. Do, do you think a lot of these small pharmacies that have been affected um, have the insurance re required in the first place? It's highly unlikely, as I said, because most of them would be beginners and they would be trying to serve their communities. So as such, you might find most of them. I mean, just this morning, I received an email from one of the small pharmacies in KZN saying he has lost three of his pharmacies. He is not even sure how is he going to start. He, he is close to mental breakdown. So that that's distorting to all of us mm. and disheartening. But yeah. we are working with the other statutory council. We should, in the next week or so, release a media release as to how we anticipate to resolve issues with regard to not only pharmacies, doctors that have been affected, nurses, and other healthcare providers. All right. How sad. Thank you very much for your time. The CEO of the regulator, the South Africa Pharmacy Council, Vincent Tlala.